Anastasia, chapter 27, Across the Dark Forces Window of Time. During that night of my dreams, I thought of how to transport people across this window of time of the dark forces. My plans My plan and conscious awareness were precise and realistic, and they accepted them. In the book you are going to write, there will be unobtrusive combinations, formulations made up of letters, and they will arouse in the majority of people good and radiant feelings. These feelings are capable of overcoming elements of body and soul and will facilitate the birth of a new awareness inherent in people of the future. Believe me, Vladimir, this is not mysticism. It is in accord with the laws of the universe. It is all very simple. You will write this book, guided only by feelings and your heart. You will not be able to do otherwise, since you have not mastered the technique of writing. But through your feelings, you can do anything. These feelings are already within you, both mine and yours. They are not something you can comprehend just yet but they will be understandable to many. When they are embodied in signs and patterns, they will be stronger than Zoroaster's fire. Do not hide anything that has happened to you, even your most intimate experiences. Free yourself from any sense of shame And do not be afraid of appearing ridiculous. Humble your pride. I have opened my whole being to you. My body and my soul. Through you, through you, I want to open myself to everyone. Now, I am permitted to do this. I know what a terrible mass of dark forces will descend upon me. They will try to counteract my dream, but I am not afraid of them. I am stronger and I will succeed in seeing my plan come true. And I will succeed in giving birth and raising my son. Our son, Vladimir, My dream will break down many of the devices of the forces of darkness, which for millennia have been acting on people destructively, and it will cause many to work for good. I know that you find yourself unable to believe me at the moment. You are prevented from doing this by the conventions and many dogmas planted in your brain by the circumstances of existence in the world in which you live. The possibility of transport through time seems incredible to you, but your concepts of time and distance are all relative. These dimensions cannot be measured by meters or seconds but by the degree of one's conscious awareness and will. The purity of the thoughts, feelings, and perception held by the majority is what determines the place of humanity and time and the universe. You believe in horoscope. You believe in your complete dependence on the position of the planets. This belief has been attained through the aid of the devices of the dark forces. This belief is slowing down the movement of the channel of light. 
allowing its dark counterpart, counterpart to advance and increase in size. This belief is leading you away from a conscious awareness of the truth, the essence of your earthly being. Analyze this question very carefully. Think about how God created man and his image and likeness. Man has been granted great freedom, the freedom to choose between the darkness and the light. Man has been given a soul. The whole visible world is subject to man. And man is free even when it comes to his relationship with God. With his relationship to God. To love him or not to love him. Nobody in in nothing can control man apart from his own will. God wants man love in return for his love. But God wants the love of a free man, perfect and his likeness. God has created everything we can see, including the planets. They serve to guarantee the order and harmony of all life, not only plants and animals. They also help human flesh. But there is no way they have power over man's heart and mind. It is not they who control man, but man controls their movements through his subconscious. If a single individual wanted a second sun to flare up in the sky, it would not appear. Things are arranged this way so that planetary catastrophes do not happen. But if everybody together wanted a second sun, it would appear. In making up a horoscope, it is necessary, first of all, to take into account the basic dimensions, the level of man's Temporal, temporal awareness, his strength of will, and his spirit, the, the aspiration of his soul, and the degree to which it participates in the life of the here and now. Favorable and unfavorable weather, magnetic storms, high and low pressure, these are all subject to will and conscious awareness. Have you never seen a happy and joyful person on a cloudy or stormy day? Or, on the other hand, a sad and depressed person on a sunny day amidst the most favorable weather conditions? You think that I am simply indulging in a crazy person fantasy when I say that the patterns and formulations of letters I should put in the book will heal people and illuminate their experience. You do not believe me because you do not understand. And yet, in fact, it is so simple. You see right now, I am talking to you in your language, using your speech idioms, and I even try sometimes to speak with your voice inflections. It would be easy for you to memorize what I say, because this is your language, belonging exclusively to you. Although understandable to many people, It contains no incomprehensible words or obscure idioms. idioms. It is simple and therefore understandable to the majority. But there are certain words or word orders which I have changed just a little, but only a little. Right now, you are in an excited state And therefore, 
Whenever you recall this state, you will recall everything I have told you. And you will write down what I have said. And that is how my combinations of letters will fall into place in your book. These combinations are very important. They, they can do wonders just like prayer. After all, many of you already know that prayers are specific combination and specific patterns of letters. These combinations and patterns are strong together with God's help by people who have had an illuminating experience. The forces of darkness have always tried to deprive men of the opportunity of drawing upon the grace emanating from these combinations. To this end, they have even changed the language, introduced new words, and removed old ones, and distorted the meaning of words. At one time, for example, there were 47 letters in your language. Now there remain 33 alone. The forces of darkness have imported other combinations and fashions of their own, stirring up base and dark elements, attempting to lead man astray by fleshly lust and passions. But I have restored their original combinations using only the letters and symbols in use today, and they will now be effective. I tried so hard to find them, and I did. I have brought together all the best from different times. I collect a good many and have hidden them in the lines that you will write. As you can see, it is simply a matter of translating the combinations of signs from the depth of eternity and infinity of the universe. If of the universe. Exact in sense, meaning, and purpose. Write about everything you have seen. Hold back nothing. Neither the bad nor the good, nor even the intimate or absurd. And then they will be preserved. You yourself will be convinced of this. Please believe me, believe me Vladimir. You will become convinced once it is written down. And many who read what has been written, feelings and emotions will be found which they are not yet able to fully understand or make sense of. They will confirm this for you. You will see and hear it confirmed. And radiant feelings will appear in them. And then many will themselves understand through the help of these feelings, a great deal more than what is written by your hand. Try writing at least a little. When you are convinced that people feel these combinations, when a dozen or a hundred or a thousand people confirm it for you, you will then believe and write down everything. Only believe. Believe in yourself believe in me. Later I can tell you things even more significant and people will understand and feel them too. I am talking about raising of children. You were interested to know about flying saucers and how they work, rockets and planets. But I so wanted to tell you more about the raising of children and I shall do so. I shall explain it when I instill in you a greater sense of conscious awareness. However, all this needs to be read when there is no interference from sounds of manufactured artificial devices around. Such sounds are harmful and lead man away from the truth. Let only the sounds of the God-created natural world be heard. They carry with them themselves 
truthful, truthful information. And grace and increases one conscious awareness. Then the healing effect will be significantly more powerful. Once again, of course, you have your doubts when you think of me and do not believe in the healing power of words. But there is no mysticism here, no mere fantasy or contradiction of the laws of spiritual being. When these radiant feelings appear on man, they cannot help but exert a beneficial influence on literally every organ of his body. It is this radiant feelings that are the most powerful and effective remedy against any kind of bodily, bodily complaint. God has healed through the help of such feelings, as did the biblical prophets and saints. Read the Old Testament and see for yourself. Certain people in your world are healing through the help of these feelings. Many of your doctors know this. Ask them if you do not believe me. After all, it is easier for you to believe them. The stronger and brighter the feeling, the greater effect it has on the person in need of healing. I have always been able to heal with my ray. Great grandfather taught me and explained everything when I was still a child. I have done this many times with my touch sticks. Now my ray is many times more powerful than grandfather's and great grandfather. That is because they say there has arisen in me another feeling, the one called love. This feeling is so great, so pleasant, and a little theory too. I want to share it with everyone and with you. As for me, I want things to be good for everyone and everything, just as God wanted them to be. Anastasia spoke her monologue with extraordinary inspiration and confidence as though aiming it across space and time, and then she fell silent. I looked at Anastasia, amazed by her uncharacteristic uncharist fervor and confidence, and then asked, Anastasia, is that it? Are there no further nuances in your plans or dreams? The rest, Vladimir, is just trifles. Nothing of great significance. I merely indeed included them. Little things as simple as A, B, C, as I was formulating the plan. There was just one sticking point concerning you, but I managed to resolve it. Well, please go into a bit more detail here. What kind of sticking point was it that concerned me? You see? I made you into the richest person on earth, and I also made you the most famous. This will happen in the near future, but when the details of my dream unfold, as yet, it had not taken off, so to speak. It had not yet been taken up by the forces of light. The forces of darkness, they are always trying to inject their own harmful input like all sorts of side effects, exerting a destructive influence on the person at the center of the dream and on the other people too. My thoughts were dashing along ever so quickly, but the forces of darkness were still keeping pace. They had left many of their other earthly affairs in their attempts to concentrate their devices on my dream. But then I came up with something. I outwitted them, and I caused all their devices to turn back and work for the good. The forces of darkness lost their bearings for less than a split second. But that was enough for my dream to be snatched up by the forces of light and trans transported into radiant infinity 
well beyond their sight and reach. And just what did you do to come up with, Anastasia? Unexpectedly for them, I extended just by a little. The dark forces wonder of time, the time you would need to meet the various challenges. In doing so, I deprived myself of the possibility of using my ray to help you. They were confounded, failing to see any logic on my part. In doing this moment, I very quickly shone my light on people who will be in touch with you in the future. And what does all that mean? People will help you, will help realize my dream. They will do this with little race of their own, which will be the most, which will be almost uncontrollable. But there will be a lot of them. And together you will make the dream come true in physical reality. You will be carried across the dark forces window of time and you will carry others with you. And becoming rich and famous will not make you greedy or arrogant because you will understand that money is not the point. It will never buy you the warmth or the genuine compassion of the human soul. You will understand this when you make your way across the window of time. When you see and get to know these people and they too will understand as for the deep knee bends, this kind of relationship with the banks is something I also thought of because you are altogether neg negligent in taking care of your body. At least you will begin, be getting some exercise whenever you withdraw money from your account. Some of the bank officials will do it besides. And never mind if it looks a little funny, it means you will find yourself free from the sin of pride. So it has turned out that all these challenges and trials which the forces of darkness have concocted in their window of time will serve to strengthen you and those around you. All this will increase your sense of conscious awareness and it will ultimately save you from the dark temptation they are so proud of. Their own action will save you. This is why they lost their bearings for a split second. Now they will never be able to catch up to my dream. Anastasia, my dear precious dreamer, my fantasy maker. Oh, how good of you to say that. Thank you. Thank you. It was so good of you to say, my dear. You're welcome. But you see... I also call you a fantasy maker, a dreamer. You're not offended. Not at all. You do not know yet how accurately my dreams always come true when they turn out so clearly and in such detail. This one will come true without fail. It is my favorite dream, the clearest of them all, and the book you write will come into being and people will start having extraordinary feelings and these feelings will call people to action. Wait, Anastasia, you're getting carried away again. Calm down. Only a short time had gone by before my interruption of Anastasia's fervent stream of speech would seem indeed but a fantasy. I couldn't quite grasp the significance behind this monologue of hers. Everything she said sounded too fantastic. Only a year later, Mikhail Fern, editors of the magazine, <coughs> Wonders and Adventures, after reading my manuscript containing this monologue, excitedly handed me the latest issue of his magazine, the issue of May 1996. The contents of the magazine overwhelmed me with excitement. Two major scholars, both academic, Jean Anatoly Akimov and Vlad Kazmashev, 
talk in their articles about the existence of a supreme mind, the close interrelationship of man and the universe, as well as about certain rays invisible to normal sight emanating from man. Scientists have now been able to identify them with special equipment and the magazine included two photographies of these rays emanating from people. But science has only begun to talk about what Anastasia has not only known from childhood, but has been applying in her daily life and her endeavors to help others. How was I to know a year earlier that this girl standing before me in an old skirt, the only one she possessed, an uncomfortable looking galoshes, nervously picking at the bottoms, nervous, nervously picking at the buttons on her cardigan. This girl named Anastasia actually possessed a vast store of knowledge as well as the ability to influence human destinies or that the pulse beats of her soul are in fact capable of counteracting the dark force, I mean the dark and destructive forces, forces threatening mankind, or that the well-known Russian healer Vladimir Murnov would tell a gathering of his assistants that we are all ants compared to her. Adding that the world has not yet known a power greater than hers, and regretting that even after spending such a long time with her, I had still not understood her. Many people were to feel the energy of a tremendous power emanating from the book. Following the first small scale printing of this book, for which I have to give credit to Anastasia herself as one author, would come a sprinkling of verse in abundance, washing away dirt like a spring rain. Now, dear reader, this is the very book which you are holding in your hands and which you are reading at this moment. Whatever feelings it is arousing in your heart, it is for you alone to judge. What do you feel? What is it calling upon you to do? Staying there alone in her glade in the Tega, Anastasia will use her ray of goodness to eliminate any barriers standing in the way of her dream, and she will gather and inspire more and more newcomers to come to make her dream come true. And so at my challenging moment, three Moscow students will come to my side and stand by me. They will not receive any significant compensation for their efforts and will even end up helping me financially. Earning their living wherever they can, they, especially Yasha Noshkov will spend nights keyboarding the Anastasia text into their computers. They will not seize their keyboarding work, even after their difficult examination sessions begin. begins. And Moscow Print Shop number 11 will put out, will put out a 2,000 copy print run. They'll do this on their own by passing a publishing house. But even before this, the journalist Evangenia Kavokta of the Agricultural Paper, Krestakiv Vedasti, will be the first to tell about Anastasia in the press. Later, El Katerina Katya Golovina from Moscow Pravado and then Lesnyada Gasev Novatsi and Radio Russia. The magazine Shotsipux Skashnia Wonders and Adventure, which published articles by the brightest lights of Russian academia, will throw tradition tradition to the wind and devote several issues to Anastasia explaining. And their oldest dreams are academics come nowhere near the insights of Anastasia, the wise woman of the Siberian taiga. Purity of thought makes man omnipotent and omniscient. Man is the apex of creation. Anastasia will be published only by the major press outlets in Moscow. 
Anastasia herself seems to have made that choice in preference to the tabloids in a careful effort to preserve the purity of her dream. But all this did not become clear to me until a year after my visit with her, not understanding her at the time and not fully believing. I had my own take on the experience and tried to shift the conversation to a topic I was more familiar with, namely entrepreneurs. Anastasia, Book 1, Chapter 28 Strong People The highest evaluation of your personality comes from those around you. Anastasia talk a lot about the people we call entrepreneurs, about their influence on public spirituality, and then took a twig and drew a circle on the ground. Inside it, she drew many little circles with a dot in the middle of each one. Up to the side, there were more circles. It was like a map of the of the planets around the earth and she kept adding still many more little circles inside and said the large circle is the earth a planet inhabited by people the little circles are small people are small groups of people linked together into collective the dots are the people in charge of these collectives. The way these these, um, heads relate to the people and their group, what they make them do, what kind of psychological climate they create through their influence, will determine whether the people around them fare well or poorly. If the majority fare well, a bright ray emanates from each of them and from the group as a whole. If poorly, then the ray is dark. And Anastasia shaded in some of the circles, making them dark. Naturally, their inner state is influenced by many other factors as well. But in the space of time during which they or in this group, the principal thing is their interrelationship with the person in charge. For the universe, it is very important that a bright radiance should emanate from the earth. The radiance of the light of love and good. This is mentioned in the Bible as well. God is love. I feel sorry, very sorry for the people you call entrepreneur. They are the most miserable of all. I would so much like to help them, but it is difficult for me to do that all by myself. You're mistaking, Anastasia. The most miserable people in our society are the pensioners, people who can't find work, can't afford a roof over their head, or even food or clothing. An entrepreneur is someone who has all these things in greater abundance than other people. He has access to pleasures which others can't even dream about. What specifically, for example? Well, even if you take the average entrepreneur, He will have a modern car and apartment. He will not have any problems with food and clothing. And what about joy? What does he find satisfaction in? Come and see for yourself. Once again, Anastasia led me to the grass. And like the first time when she showed me the woman Dachnik, she began to show me other scenes. You see? There he is, sitting right now in a car you would call pretty snazzy. You see? He is sitting alone in the back seat, and the car is air-conditioned, and it has its own micro 
climate, so to speak. His chauffeur is driving it very smoothly. But look and see how worried and pensive the entrepreneur sitting in the back seat is. He is thinking, working out plans. He is afraid of something. See, he has picked up what you call a telephone. He is upset. Yes, he has just received some news. Now he must quickly evaluate the situation and make a decision. He is all tense up, thinking. Now he is ready. The decision has been made. Now look. Look, he appears to be sitting peacefully, but his face betrays doubt and concern, and there is no joy. That's work, Anastasia. That is a way of life, and there is no respite in it from the moment. He wakes in the morning until the moment he goes to bed at night, or even in his sleep, and he sees neither the and he sees neither the leaves unfolding on the tree nor the streams of spring. All around him are perennial, envious onlookers desiring to have what he has. His attempts to fence himself off from those but what you call bodyguards. A house, more of a citadel actually, do not bring any complete sense of peace. Since fear and worry have crept in and will forever remain with him. This goes on until his dying day and just before the end of his life. He feels a sense of regret that he is obliged to leave it all behind. An entrepreneur has joys, I observe. They come when he obtains a desired result or fulfills a plan he thought up. Not true, Vladimir. He never gets to enjoy his acquisitions, since along comes another plan immediately to take its place, or more complicated plan. And the whole process begins again from scratch, only with greater challenges. This forest princess painted me a rather sad and gloomy picture of our outward, outwardly well-off social class. And this was not a picture I felt like accepting. I attempt a counter of argument. You forgot Anastasia. Their ability to reach a set goal and obtain the good things in life. Excited glances from women. Respect by people around them. To which she replied. Sheer illusion. There is nothing of the sort. Where have you ever seen a respectful or an excited glance directed at a passenger in a snazzy car or at the owner of the fancier house in town. Not a single person will confirm what you have just said. These are but glances of envy, indifference, and irritation. And even women cannot love these people because their feelings is mixed in with their desire to possess not only the man but his property too. The man in turn cannot really love a woman for there is no way they can free up enough room for such an important feeling. It was useless to look for further arguments since what she said could be confirmed or refuted only the people she was talking about. As an entrepreneur myself, I never really thought about what Anastasia was describing. Never analyze how many minutes of joy I actually experience, and most certainly could not do this for anyone else. For some reason, it is simply not accepted in entrepreneurs. Circles to whine or complain. Everyone tries to show himself as successful and content with life. There is no doubt why most people hold the stereotype image of the entrepreneur, entrepreneur, entrepreneur as someone who has received more than his share of good things in life. Anastasia was perceiving not the externally expressed feelings, but those which are more delicate and hidden in the inner recesses of one's heart. 
She was measuring a person's state of well-being by the amount of light she could detect in them. As to the scenes and situations she was able to see, I thought I was picturing them more from listening to her. I mentioned this to Anastasia and she responded. I shall help you now. It is simple. Close your eyes, lie down on the grass, hands on to the sides, and relax. I mean, hands out to the sides and relax. Picture in your mind the whole earth. Try to see its color and the pale bluish glow emanating from it. The narrower the focus of your imagination is ray so that it does not take in the whole earth. Rather make it narrower, narrower and narrower until you see concrete details. Look for people where the bluish light is stronger than in the other places. Keep on narrowing your way, your way, and you will eventually focus on one person or a small group. Now try again with my help. She took me by the hand, ran her fingers along mine, resting her fingertips in my palm. The fingers of her other hand, which was lying on the grass, were pointed upward. I went through in my mind all the steps she outlined and began to get a fuzzy image of three people sitting at a table, engaged in a lively conversation. I couldn't understand what they were saying as I wasn't picking up any voices at all. No, said Anastasia, those are not entrepreneurs. Wait a minute, wait a moment, we shall find some. She searched and searched with her ray, peering into offices, both large and small, private clubs, party celebrations, and bordolos. The bluish glow was either very weak or not there at all. Look, it is nighttime here already, and this entrepreneur is sitting alone in a smoky office. Something is not right. But look at that one, how content he looks in a swimming pool, surrounded by pretty girls. He is tipsy, but there is no glow. He is simply trying to run away from something. His feeling of self-satisfaction is artificial. This one is at home. There is his wife, and his little one is asking him something. The telephone is ringing. You see there? He has become serious again and pushed his family to the background. All sorts of situations became illuminated one after another. Some of them outwardly good and some not so good. Until we, ha we, until we happen upon a, more fright a most frightening scene. All at once appeared a room, probably in some apartment quite nice looking, but on a round table lay a naked man, his hands and feet tied to the table legs, his head hanging over, his mouth covered with brown sticky tape. At the table were sitting two burly looking youths, one of them with a close shaven head, the other with smooth slick hair. A little distance away, under a floor lamp, there was a young woman in an armchair. Her mouth was also taped over, and she was tied to the chair with her linen sash, bound tight around her waist. Both her legs were tied to the chair legs. She was wearing nothing but a torn undergarment. Next to her, was sitting a thin, weary man who was taking a drink of something, possibly cognac. On a small table in front of him lay a chocolate bar. The youths sitting at the round table weren't drinking. I could see them pouring some kind of liquid over the chest of the man lying on the table, vodka or pure alcohol. 
and set it alight. A break in, I surmise. Anastasia shifts her rays away from the scene. But I cried out, go back, do something. She went back to the scene and replied, I cannot, it has already happened. This cannot be stopped now. It should have been stopped earlier, but now it is too late. I watched Spellbond and suddenly got a clear glimpse of the woman's eyes, filled with sheer horror and not even pleading for mercy. Do something, I cried to Anastasia. If you have any heart at all, do at least something. It is not within my power. Everything has been, so to speak, programmed in advance, but not by me. I cannot interfere directly. They have the upper hand right now. But where's the goodness of yours? Your power, your powers. Anastasia didn't say a word. The horrifying scene began to blur a little. Then the older man who had been drinking the cognac suddenly disappeared. All at once, I felt a weakness throughout my body. I could also feel the arm Anastasia was starting, was touching, start to grow numb. I could hear her somehow weakened voice with evident, with evident difficulty in getting out the words. Take your hand away, Vladi. She couldn't even finish saying my name. I stood up and drew my hand away. My arm just hung there as if paralyzed. As happens sometimes when they get a tingling sensation in your arms or legs and went completely white. Then I wiggle my fingers a little and the numbness began to go away. I looked at Anastasia in shock. Her eyes were closed. The blush had drained from her cheeks and it seemed as though there was not a drop of blood left under the skin on her hands and face. She did not even seem to be breathing as she lay there. The grass for about three meters all around her had also become white and bent over. I realized something terrible had happened and I cried out, Anastasia, what, what's happened to you, Anastasia? But there was not even the slightest response to my cry. Then I grabbed her by the soldier and shoulder, shoulders and shook her body, which was no longer supple, but had somehow gone limp. There was no response. Her completely white, bloodless lips remained silent. Can you hear me, Anastasia? She opened her eyelids ever so slightly and looked at me. Through her dim eyes, which had lost all all their characteristic expression. I grabbed a flask of water, lifted up Anastasia's head, and tried to give her something to drink, but she was unable to swallow. I looked at her, feverishly wondering what to do. At long last, she managed to move her lips just a tiny bit and to whisper, carry me over there to the tree. I lift her limp body and carried out it out the circle of the white grass, whitened grass, and laid it down by the nearest cedar tree. In a little while, she started to come round, and I asked, What happened to you, Anastasia? I tried to fulfill your request, she quietly said, and a moment later added, I think I succeeded. But you look so bad, you almost died. I violated the natural laws. I interfere in something I should not have. That required all my strength and energy. I am surprised that they held out at all. Why did you take such a risk if you knew it was so dangerous? I had no choice. After all, you wanted me to do something. I was afraid that if I did not fulfill your request, you would lose all respect for me. You would think that all I can do is talk, that I am all words, 
and that I would not do anything in real life. In real life. Her eyes looked at me inquiringly and pleadingly. Her soft voice trembled a little as she spoke. But I cannot explain to you how to do it, how this natural system works. I feel it, but I cannot explain to you in a way you could understand, and your scholars probably will not be able to explain it either. She bowed her head, fell silent for a while. She bowed her head, fell silent for a while, as though master, as as though mused, mustering her strength. Then she looked at me once more with pleading eyes and said, Now you are going to be even more persuaded that I am abnormal or a witch. All at once I felt the tremendous urge to do something good for her, but what? I wanted to tell her that I did not consider her, that I did not consider her a normal human being, a beautiful and intelligent woman, but in all honesty, I didn't feel about her the way I usually felt about women, and she, with that intuition of hers, would not believe me. And then I suddenly recall her story about how her great-grandfather customarily greeted her as a child, about how this old gray hair fellow would stand on one knee before the little Anastasia and kiss her hand. I got down on one knee before Anastasia, grasped hold of her spirit, still pale and slightly cold hand kissed it and said if you are indeed abnormal then you are the best the kindest the cleverest and the most beautiful of all abnormal people ever at long last a smile once more alight alighted upon anastasia's lips and her eyes looked at me in gratitude a rosy blush was coming back to her cheeks Anastasia, that was quite a depressing scene. Did you choose it deliberately? I was looking for something good, just as an example, but I could not find anything. They all, they are all held in the grip of their worries and cares. They are constantly facing their problems all alone. They have practically no spiritual communication. So what can be done? What can you suggest apart from pitying them? And I should tell you these, these are strong people, these entrepreneurs, very strong. She agreed, and most interesting. It is as though they are living two lives in one. One life is known only to them and not even their family, while the other is the outward life, which people around them see. They can only be helped through increasing their sincere spiritual communication with each other. They need to strive with complete sincerity for purity of thought. Anastasia, in all probability, I should try to do what you have asked. And I should try to write a book and establish an organization of entrepreneurs with pure thoughts, but only in a way that I can understand. It will be difficult for you. I shall not be able to offer you sufficient help. I have little strength left. It will take a long time for my strength to recover. For a time, I shall not be able to see at a distance with my ray. I am having difficulty seeing you right now with my or, or, ordinary eyesight. <clears throat> Don't tell me you're going blind, Anastasia. I think it will all get better. Only it is a pity for pity that for some time I shall not be able to help you. You don't need to help me, Anastasia. Just try to keep yourself for your son and help other people. <clears throat> I needed to leave to catch up to my ship. After waiting until she had started to regain her almost normal appearance, I got into the motorboat. Anastasia took hold of the bow of the bow with her hand and pushed the boat away from the shore. The boat was swept up and began floating downstream with the current. Anastasia stood in the water almost up to her knees. The hem of her long skirt got wet and flapped about in the waves. I gave the steering cord a tug. The motor whirled, roared into life, breaking the silence. I had grown accustomed to over the past three days. 
The boat gave a jerk forward, picked up more and more speed, and soon began to distance itself from the diminutive figure of the Taiga Recross, standing all alone in the shallow water near the riverbank. All at once, Anastasia rushed out of the water and started running along the bank after the boat. Her long hair trailing behind from the headwind looked like a comet's tail. She tried to run very fast, probably using up all her remaining strength in an effort to do the impossible. Catch up to a speeding motorboat. But even she wasn't up to that. The distance between us gradually increased. I started feeling sorry for her fruitless efforts. Wanting to shorten the difficult moments of parting, I pushed down on the gas, lever with all my might. Then she, then she thought, then the thought flashed through my head that Anastasia might think that I had taken fright once more and was running away. The motor now roaring in bursts, lift the boat's bow out of the water, making it speed forward faster and faster and increasing the distance between us even more. As for her, as for her, oh Lord, what was she doing? Anastasia ripped off the wet skirt that was slowing her down and cast aside her torn clothes. She increased her tempo. And the incredible happened. The distance between her and the boat gradually began to decrease. On the path ahead of her loomed a steep slope, leading to an almost vertical drop-off. Continuing to press the gas lever to the limit, I thought that the incline would stop her in her tracks and bring this difficult episode to a quick end. But Anastasia continued her headlong rush, occasionally stretching out her arms in front of her as though using them to sense the space ahead. Could it be that her eyesight had become so poor that she couldn't see the slope? Without slowing down at the least, Anastasia ran straight up the slope. Reaching the top, she fell on her knees, threw up her arms toward the sky, turned slightly in my direction, and began shouting something. I could hear her voice over the round whirl of the motor and the noise of the waves. I heard as though it were in a whisper. There are, there are shallows ahead, shallows, sunken lo logs. I quickly jerked my head forward, not fully able to grasp what was happening, and gave such a hard pull on the rudder that the lower side of the sharply tilted boat almost submerged to the point of taking on water. A huge sunken log, one end grounded, in a sandbar, the other barely visible on the surface, lightly scrap against the side of the speeding boat. If it had been a direct hit, it would easily have torn a gapping hole in the thin aluminum bottom. Once out in mid-channel, I turned to glance at the cliff and whispered in the direction of the lonely figure, standing on her knees which was slowly being transformed into a varnishing, a vanishing dot. Thank you, Anastasia. Anastasia, book one, chapter 29. Who are you, Anastasia? The ship was waiting for me at Surgut. The captain and crew were awaiting my instructions. But there was no way I could concentrate my efforts on working out the subsequent itinerary and ordered the ship's crew to continue standing and port at Surgat, hold parties for the local population to come and have a good time, and keep up the promotion and sales exhibits. My thoughts were occupied with my experiences with Anastasia. At a local shop, I purchased a great deal of popular, popular science literature, books on extraordinary occurrence, occurrence and people's unusual abilities, as well as the history of Serbia. 
I squirreled myself away in my cabin, trying to find in all these books some sort of plausible explanation. In addition, I wondered whether Anastasia's shouting of I love you, Vladimir, and her attempts to help the village girl could have really engendered in her a feeling of love for me. How is that mere words which we often water without putting a sufficient amount of suitable fillings into them? could have affected Anastasia, in spite of the difference in our ages and views on life and lifestyles. The popular science literature gave me no clues. Then I picked up the Bible, and there it was. My answer, my answer. At the very outset of the Gospel, according to John, I read, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. For the up tenth time, it struck me how laconic and precise were the definition of this amazing book. Immediately, a lot of things became clearer in my mind. Anastasia, and capable as she was of trickery or deceit, could not just simply utter meaningless words. I remembered her saying, It seemed as though I had forgotten at that moment that it was not enough just to simply utter those words. There definitely had to be behind them feelings and awareness and trustworthiness of natural information. Oh God, how disappointingly, disappointingly her hopes had turned out. Why had she addressed these words to me? Here I was, no longer in my prime, someone with a family, enslaved to a great many of this world's temp temptations dark and destructive, as she herself said. With her degree of inner purity, she deserved someone else entirely. But who could fall in love with her, given such an extraordinary lifestyle, mentality and intellect? At first glance, she comes across as an ordinary girl, albeit extremely beautiful and attractive. But once you get to know her, it is as though she is transformed into some kind of creature living way beyond the bounds of the rational. It may very well be that this impression of mine is due, is due to my imperfect knowledge of things, my insufficient understanding of what constitutes our being. Others might have an entirely different perception of her. I recall that even at our parting, I did not feel any particular desire to kiss or embrace her. I don't know whether she would have wanted me to or not. Anyway, what exactly did she want? I recall her telling me of her dreams. What a strange philosophical bent her love had organized a fellowship of, of entrepreneurs to help them. Write a book passing along her advice to people, carry people across the dark forces window of time. And she believed it all. She is convinced that's how it will all turn out. Oh, I was a good one. I promised I would try 
and organize a fellowship of entrepreneurs and write a book. Now she'll probably be, she, now she probably will be having even more fantastic dreams about that. She might have thought up something simpler, more realistic. An explicable sense of pity for Anastasia arose in my heart. I could imagine her sitting there in her forest, waiting and dreaming that everything would work out. That way, in raw daylight. Fine. If she was simply content to wait and dream. But who knows? She may go beyond that and start taking steps on her own, focusing that ray of goodness of hers, expending the colossal energy of her heart and believing in the impossible. And even though she showed me what she could do with her ray and attempt to explain to me how it worked, somehow my, con my consciousness still can accept it as something real. Judge for yourselves, dear readers, in her own words, she aims her ray at a person, illuminates this person, this man, with an invisible light, and imparts in him her feelings and aspiration toward goodness and light. No. No, do not just think that I am interfering with a person's mental, mental makeup, that I am violating his heart and mind. I remember her telling me, man is free, people are free to accept or reject my advice, only to the degree that they themselves find it to their liking something close to their heart, will they be able to accept these feelings as their own? Then they will become lighter and lighter, and their appearance too. And your disease will have them either partially or completely. My grandfather and great-grandfather father can do this, and I have always been able to great-grandfather taught me when he played with me in my childhood. But now, my ray has become many times stronger than grandfather's and great-grandfather's because in me has been born that extraordinary feeling called love. It is so bright and clear and even a little furry. There is such a lot of it, and I want to share it. With whom, Anastasia, I asked, I had asked. With you, with others, with everyone who can accept it. I want everyone to experience good. When you begin to do what I have dreamt of, I should bring many of these people to see you, and together you. Remembering all this, picturing her in my mind, I suddenly realized that I couldn't help her. I suddenly realized that I couldn't help but carry out, at least try to carry out her wishes. If I didn't, I would be tormented with doubt for the rest of my life along with the feeling that I had betrayed Anastasia and her dream. Perhaps her dream wasn't all that realistic, but it was something she passionately desired. I made my decision, and the ship headed full steam for Novosibirsk. The unloading and assembly of the exhibit equipment I left to my firm's executive director. After somehow managing to explain the situation to my wife, I set out for Moscow. 
I set out from Moscow to make or at least try to make Anastasia's dream come true. To be continued.